Welcome to Season 7 of the Retail Tea Break Podcast. My name is Melissa Moore, the Retail Advisor and Rethink Retail Top Retail Expert for 2024. Each week, I'll be joined by industry experts, retailers and brands to dispel the myths, share knowledge and give you an insight into the retail industry. Listen back to previous episodes on your favourite podcast platform or, of course, on YouTube. And while you're there, please do subscribe to the podcast so that you get to listen first every single week. So in the meantime, grab that cup of tea, sit back and listen in to season seven of the Retail Tea Break podcast. Today, I'm joined by a guest who really understands how AI can impact and support retail. The strategy consultant, startup investor, book author and columnist is also an associate professor of management practice at Babson College. He's a faculty lead for the core undergraduate strategy course and has created popular electives on startup cities and scaling strategy. His strategy consulting firm has completed over 150 projects to help companies identify, evaluate and profit from growth opportunities created by changing technology. He's invested in seven startups, three of which were sold for a staggering figure of over $2 billion, one of which, Sophie, went public in 2021 at an estimated valuation of $18 billion. Today's guest is also author of 17 books, a senior contributor to Forbes and a contributor to Inc., Rethink Retail named him a top retail expert every year between 2021 and 2024 and has chosen him as a top AI leader in the inaugural list 2024 this year. So no better guest for the show. Peter Cohen, welcome to the Retail Tea Break podcast. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be with you. I'm genuinely thrilled that you've decided to come on to the podcast because, look, AI has obviously been the forefront of retail now for the last kind of maybe 18 months. And I suppose what a lot of us are seeing is there's lots of AI experts out there who think they know how AI might support and help retail, but very few of them actually understand retail. So it's great to have you on today's episode because you understand both. You know, you've been at the forefront of both for a while now. So really looking forward to this. But look, before we start in the age old fashion of the Retail Tea Break podcast, In the time that it takes to boil a kettle, which I am told, Peter, is about two minutes. Tell us a little bit more about you and your background in the industry. Um, Okay, well, let me sort of focus on why I wrote this book. And it it will get into some of those questions. I I have a fairly long history in generative AI, in, in AI in general, and in analyzing how technology affects different industries. So many decades ago, when I was in graduate school at MIT, I went to work for a startup founded by a uh, former MIT professor, and it was basically set up to apply something called expert systems, which is a form of artificial intelligence, to helping personal financial planners. It has nothing to do with, it sort of has something to do with a very important principle underlying my approach to analyzing it, which is that this was a company that was really interesting, great technology, a brilliant founder, brilliant people, and it failed. And the reason it failed was because the product did not create value for the person that they were trying to sell it to. You know, some people bought it, but it really was not solving an important point of pain for those people and it was too expensive. So it doesn't matter. This is one of the key lessons that I learned. It doesn't matter how great your team is, how brilliant the technology is. If it doesn't solve a real human problem, a human human pain and relieve it, that pain better than competing products, uh, it will just, it will just fade into history. So I, I, I do work there. I also went to work for a, a, a professor at Harvard Business School after I got my MBA named Michael Porter, who's sort of famous for business strategy. Uh, I started my own firm, as you mentioned, and then I started writing books. And I ended up writing three books about the dot-com era. Some of those investments that you mentioned, I uh, invested in during the dot-com era. So what I got to do was see um, how you could sort of break down the entire business into different components of uh, different people that are playing in the industry and also which ones are going to be the winners, which ones are not going to be the winners and why. And so this was really, really helpful when in May of 2023, NVIDIA came along with this amazing forecast for how much growth they were going to enjoy because of generative AI. And I immediately set out to try to write a book about this. And so that is a sort of, that's sort of my short story, but I will say that my involvement in retail uh, has been pretty extensive. I wrote a book which came out in uh, 2020 about 
uh, called Goliath Strikes Back. And it was basically about how all these large retailers, which, which, you know, bricks and mortar retailers were actually competing quite effectively with some of the startups. And of course, during the pandemic, one of the reasons was because they, you could, you could order something online and pick it up outside the store uh, safely. So that was the first year that I was, I was chosen as a top retail expert, but I've done a lot of projects in the retail industry. And, you know, last four years, I've been continuing to follow it closely. Fantastic. Such an incredible backstory, Peter. It's amazing that all you've done. And actually, just to mention there, this 17th book, the latest one, it's called Brain Rush, How to Invest and Compete in the Real World of Generative AI. And as you say, it's just, it's the newest of of a long line of books you've written. What fascinates me as someone that dabbles, I want to say, in education, certainly not at the extent you do, you've designed a framework called the Value Pyramid. And I think this in itself will bring huge value and understanding to those watching and listening. And the idea around the value of pyramid you've written is to help businesses understand the potential value and the impact of generative AI in their business. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, that's a, a framework that I developed after I wrote the book. I was starting to do podcasts and talking to people about it. And, you know, I realized that this was a, an important question is, what you're spending all this money on on generative AI, where is the payoff coming from? How can we, you know, create value? And I, I, I thought about all the different uh, ways that people are using it and came up with this idea of a value pyramid, which has sort of three slices. The bottom layer is essentially the way most people are using it right now, which is essentially what I call overcoming creator's block. I, didn't, I, I would have normally said writer's block. Uh, you know, I write a lot, so I, I understand the concept of writer's block, but there's all sorts of other things that people create and they can use generative AI to sort of type in a sentence, you know, here's what I'm trying to do, help me get started, and it will help you get started. And it will save you a lot of time. Uh, I know that it's a very human thing to do is to say, oh, I've got this deadline, I don't know what to do, I'm really worried, so I'm going to do nothing. And this kind of helps you uh, get over that hump. And so that's, you know, that's useful for people. I mean, I think that's, you know, really, you know, something a lot of people are doing. And for those of those people out there, I know there are people who are kind of afraid of, uh, of generative AI, afraid it's going to take their jobs and cause all these problems. But I, I think to overcome that, one way to overcome that fear is to start trying to use it for different things. And it's very easy to, to use it for these kinds of creators block, overcoming creators block uses. So that is, that is one way that individuals and companies are using it. And a lot of companies are asking their employees to sort of try it out, even though it, it doesn't necessarily always directly relate to a specific business process, but it's definitely getting people comfortable with it. The next level, the second level of the pyramid is basically the one that improves what I call improving functional productivity. And when I say functional productivity, what I'm talking about are business activities like customer service, marketing, sales, writing computer code, things that, you know, lots of people in specific departments and sometimes across different functions in the organization are doing. And, and that, those applications, some of those are, are really uh, helpful in retail. So we can talk about those in a minute. And then sort of the peak of the pyramid, the top little part, the pinnacle of the pyramid is what I call the dry, creating new growth curves, using the technology to create new growth curves. And one of the things that I probably didn't mention is that I, I started going on television and CNBC and talking about stock prices and technology stock prices many years ago during the dot-com era. And I realized at that time, I know nothing about why stocks go up and down, but I kind of kept looking at it and trying to figure out what makes them go up and down. And I finally came up with a theory that I still think works pretty well. And that is the beat and raise theory. The idea that if a company every quarter is able to exceed investor expectations and raise guidance of what they're going to do in the next quarter or the next year, their stock price will go up. And if it, if it re- reports disappointing results, and doesn't raise their guidance, the stock price goes down. And that makes people think, oh, well, you know, that means that uh, there's no point in investing because everything is totally short term. But I would definitely disagree with that because of the concept of product life cycles, which basically means that products, you know, start off slow. Sometimes they catch on and they grow really fast. Then they sort of slow down and start to mature. So if your business is wholly dependent on this uh, product life cycle, uh, a product that's late in the product life cycle, and you don't invest in something new, then your growth is going to slow down and you run the risk of disappointing investors. And that won't be good for the value of your company. So that's where generative AI, I think, will get the biggest 
payoff for investors, people who are building these systems is in uh, creating new growth curves, new ways to generate revenue that are on the up, upswing uh, and will help offset the maturing of their core uh, business. And that's sort of the pinnacle of the, of the pyramid where I don't know if any companies are doing that yet. Uh, I don't really see necessarily a killer app where companies are doing that, but that's what they should be striving towards. And that's why I think this is a somewhat useful framework. If you, if you just took a company and sort of mapped out where are all our generative AI experiments, how do they fit into this you know, value pyramid, that would be a useful start to sort of assess what, what are we doing right? What could we be doing differently? So do you think then from what you're seeing that most companies right now are in that kind of comfortable semi-creative phase along the bottom, might be dabbling into that middle ground, whether it's customer service or, you know, starting to move it across different departments. But as you said, no one's at the top there. No one's using this and I suppose pumping generative AI to grow the company. What are you seeing out there that retailers are using and doing, I suppose? Well, I'll tell you one of the things in retail that I find has had the, has the most potential value. And it's kind of relatively prosaic, but it's basically, you know, many years ago, I go into a Walmart or any kind of a a retail store and they have these printed newspaper circulars, which had kind of discounts on on items that you might want to buy. And so they were the same for everybody who walked into the store. They were the same for anybody who received them. Uh, Now with generative AI, what you can do is you can study uh, the, the buying patterns of each individual person and you can create sort of customized weekly uh, discounts that you kind of send into their, I don't know, to their iPhone or to wherever they're getting information. And it's, it kind of, it's, it's related to their specific uh, purchasing patterns, what people like them have bought. And it's, and it basically they're discounts that will bring people into the store and those kinds of, you know, AI empowered sort of personalized weekly digital circulars can increase revenues by somewhere between two and 3%, which is a nice, a nice little increase, I think, in in the in the revenue that that would be generated by the company otherwise. So that's one area that companies are are, are experimenting with this, and some are rolling it out. The other area, which I think is more powerful in in, in many respects, is the idea of twenty four seven customer service. You know, people are not uh, just shopping when the stores are open; they are shopping all hours of the day and night, every day. It doesn't matter if it's vacation or not. So if they have some question or problem and they can get an answer um, from an AI that solves the problem and does it, you know, does it correctly, they are going to be very excited about, very excited about doing business with this company and continuing to, to buy more. But this gets into the reason why more people are not doing this. It sounds like, you know, the way the good retailers are using it, and I suppose, again, we've got to differentiate between those that haven't a clue what's going on and those that are really trying to hone a strategy here, to coin your phrase, it's driving loyalty. You know, everything you've talked about there is really driving the loyal customers because they feel like the shopping experience is specific for them. Yes, exactly. So essentially, this is really interesting to me because it's about customer retention and keeping those customers there. But there's also the the other side of it, which is why more more people are not doing this is because the typical large company is doing up to 200 different experiments with generative AI. Of those 200, they they may be releasing one or two inside the company. So nothing that goes outside of the company. And then maybe one at most that actually goes between the company and the, the customer outside of the company. So the, the reason that this are, so this reflects sort of a, a psychological battle going on between the CEOs who you know went to J- Davos in January and come back saying you know if we don't spend money on generative AI we're going to fall behind our competition, and then you've got the board of directors which is terrified of these uh, hallucinations. You know there's well known examples. Basically, Air Canada had a bereavement fair that was described to a a passenger, and he had to cancel the flight, and it was described by the by Air Canada's AI. So this this was going to cost Air Canada money, and because it was going to cost Air Canada money, Air Canada decided they wanted to get out of it, and a tribunal up in Canada forced them to honor what the AI miscommunicated to that that passenger. So you know this is a minor a minor thing in the grand scheme of things. I mean there are other things that are almost funny, like Google telling people that they should put glue on their pizza and eat a rock every day. You know, I hear these things and it sounds really funny, but 
you know, if you're a board of directors, you know, you're worrying. And I, and I sat in on, on a meeting of some retail executives this summer where the palpable fear was so strong. I mean, it was like it was coming through to me so strong that they were so afraid of, of making a mistake, afraid of, of being sued, afraid of their employees uploading proprietary company documents to chat GPT, to train chat GPT. So all these different risks, they were so afraid of those. So you have the conflict between you know, the, the CEO saying, we got to get into AI, we got to keep up with the competition and the board worrying about all the liability. So as a result of that, they're very, very cautious about releasing anything outside of, of the company. And to me, that is you know, the prime reason why there's been a relatively small amount of, of these customer facing applications actually released to the public. Do, do you think though businesses are right to be cautious? Because I suppose of those examples that you've told us, or actually going back to your pyramid and the strategy at the very top of that pyramid, do companies need to take the chance and drive the business forward? You know, retail is meant to be agile. It's meant to be innovative. From everything you've read and everything you've documented, where do you sit on, you know, should they be pushing forward or should they yes, actually well, be as cautious a lot as they of, are? A lot of it depends on the, on the mindset of the CEO, which I find you know, really interesting, you know, as, I, as I've had a, a career in basically strategy, which is sort of a more of an analytical discipline that, that I found that the human psychology is playing a huge role in, in whether it works or not. So, you know, for, for instance, just last week, I was talking to the, the CEO of a company, which is doing a really powerful job of creating these customer service AI chatbots that, that do a really good job. And he's very cognizant, somebody with a career in customer service, managing software for customer service is doing a great job of, of figuring out how to make it safe and to, to create a business model, which lowers the risk for companies. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is that, that this particular CEO has a mindset, and I talk about this in the book, of a cognitive hunger. This is a person who has cognitive hunger, who wants to keep learning, who does not believe that just because he was successful in the past doing something that that strategy will always apply to future problems. He's always trying to learn how to solve the real problems that are happening now, rather than trying to sort of say, well, this worked for me 10 years ago, so we're going to do that again. And, you know, I, I've talked to my students many times about how this mindset of cognitive lock-in, which is the flip side of that, kind of caused the downfall of Bed Bath & Beyond, because they brought in somebody from Target who had you use private label as part of the strategy to turn around Target. So they figured that would also work at Bed Bath & Beyond, but they failed to interview the customers and say, you know, find out why do they buy at Bed Bath & Beyond. So they gave them products on the shelves they didn't want and they, no one wanted to buy them. So it's that cognitive lock-in that is keeping some CEOs from doing the right thing. Some of those CEOs, I think, might be saying, you know, I'm going to hire a chief IT officer. I'm going to tell them, here's what we're going to do, and then I'll let them handle it. What you need is, is a CEO who's going to get intimately involved in, in re-engineering the business processes and interacting with the customers and making sure that what they are putting out there is getting better and, and very concerned about the quality and the way it's going to affect the people who are ultimately going to use it, which will affect ultimately the success or failure to create a new growth curve for the company. That, that in, involvement by a CEO and kind of thinking through and get in managing. So it's a completely different process of how to manage uh, new product development. I love it. And actually, there's so much interesting stuff there that they have to take that risk. But actually, it's a risk tied into talking to their customer. So none of this is done for the sake of AI because the competition's doing it. It brings back to that really basic retail fundamental that we talk about on the podcast all the time. We've got to talk to the customers first. Yes. If you, if you don't, I mean, this is obviously true for, I think it's true for every business, but for retail, it's obviously true for the people who are the ultimate people buying your product or not buying your product. So, you know, I had in, in, my, in my book, I, I had an example of a CEO who I talked to in the Boston area who had one really bad experience with an AI customer service and one really good experience. And, the, and what happened with the really bad experience was that he said, I am never doing business with this company again because it was so bad. And so, you know, instead of having customer retention, you lose a customer who was formerly loyal because you gave them such bad service and you didn't really care enough to make sure that they were getting good service. What you're trying to do was deflect a customer service call to a machine so it would save you some money. So, yeah, this is another general theme I've noticed in retail is executives trying to save money 
thinking technology is just a cost cutting thing uh, and not uh, not realizing that it could destroy what I think is the most valuable thing a company has, which is its relationships with existing customers. Of course, another super valuable thing is the ability to create new customers and then make them you know, ongoing you know, customers. But basically, uh, yeah, this does remind me of another example, which was the sort of the, the death of Circuit City. I don't know if you remember Circuit City, but Circuit City was a, a retailer that basically got beaten by Amazon and Best Buy because essentially the CEO came in and said, I want to increase uh, the company's earnings per share this year so I can get a $7 million bonus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire, you know, what was it? 30 some, 3,000 some odd very experienced salespeople who could really interact well with the customers and solve their problem with 2,400 lower paid contract workers and customer complaints soared and people stopped buying and that was the end of it. Crikey. That's that's a hell of a story. And actually, it's really interesting because it leads me into something I'm fascinated by, again, as someone that works and trains with an awful lot of retail people on the shop floor. There's obviously been a lot of talk over the last few years about AI taking away jobs, you know, removing the need for people to do certain roles, especially on the shop floor or those admin roles or, again, those customer kind of almost customer service roles in the background. Do you mm-hmm. think, though, from everything you've read again and all the research you've done, do you think people in retail can AI-proof their careers for want of a way of terming it? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the things that I've noticed about people who are using this technology for customer service is that they are essentially making everybody on the floor sort of have a higher level of, of quality in their service because they're training the, the AI model in such a way that it will it will answer a question in the way that the the most successful customer service agent answers the question. And they will essentially take away, you know, the time that somebody is sitting there typing, trying to find the answer and sort of basically whisper in their ear and tell them what to say. And, you know, if that answer is always correct and always the best answer, then that person is going to essentially have a a much better relationship and can go from sort of defense to offense. They can start you know, now that they've solved the problem, they can say, well, why don't you think about buying this? Or here's a, here's a new service we could offer that would, would help you. So essentially what it does is it can change the job from one which is you know, solely one focused on reducing the time to get a correct answer so you can spend the minimum amount of time uh, interacting with that customer to turning that person into somebody who also contributes to the revenue growth of the company once they've had a happy customers happy with the resolution then they're more open to a suggestion to buy something else. So to me, that could actually be something which would uh, make the job more interesting and, and also potentially more lucrative if the person was compensated for sort of bringing in some additional uh, revenue. So it could be a job enhancer, and it could also be something that would in- enhance the relationship between the company and the employee. And you know, this, this company that I was talking to, a, a startup in, in San Francisco called Crescendo, I was just sort of struck by all the, you know, the benefits uh, of, of doing this kind of transforming of the customer service role. You know, the person on the floor could potentially be using something like that as well, I think. I think it's really nice that you're actually, we're reframing the way we do roles or the way roles have traditionally been. And actually, again, by the way you talk about it, this is benefiting not only the, you know, the shop worker, the customer service worker, it's benefiting the customer. We're just moving and changing the way it's talked about, but also the expectation. So again, we're embracing this idea of generative AI but we're also building that loyal customer base. And I think that's got to be key as part of that top of your pyramid strategy there is to bring this customer right into the heart of it all. And I'm fascinated. How do you think, or any examples, I suppose, you've got of the retailers you've been talking to about this, where are they really bringing the value? Is it in those kind of calls where, you know, they might've called, something's gone wrong, but actually we've been able to turn it around? Or is it through things like, I suppose, the personalized offers? Or is it a mix of everything? What are you seeing? Well, I mean, the thing that I that I have seen mostly just because of, I've had conversations with uh, CEOs who are who are doing the doing these companies to do this is in in the thing where they're enhancing the job. They're they're making the person who's interacting with the customer more knowledgeable, giving better answers, getting the the problem, and you know, making people realize that with the properly trained and you know de hallucinated AI they're going to get uh, a prompt answer to the question much more than you know, 
they're they're trained, I think, by many companies that are misusing technology, I think, to to expect the AI to just try to get them off the line and keep them from talking to a person. And so, you know, that whole focus, when you have a company that has a different mindset, that really is where I'm seeing things. I completely agree. And actually, I think this is what I'm really getting out of this conversation, Peter, is that we need to tie everything together. It's not about leaving kind of generative AI in a silo. It's not bringing it on board the company strategy because we have to do it. It's feeding it into all the aspects. So ensuring that the people, you know, whether it's on the shop floor or whether it's in customer service, embrace it and then change and adapt to it. And likewise, as you say, we've actually got to bring the customer in on this. And again, I'm sure the more they're educated or we show them the benefits, the more everyone there's going to be happy. And of course, then stakeholders or shareholders will be as well. Yeah, I mean, customer service is really uh, an emotional experience for for people. Usually when they call up, you know, they're they're kind of feeling you know uncomfortable, maybe scared because, you know, they got this problem and they, they think it's not going to work out. And, you know, if anything goes wrong, they, they start being, you know, abusive sometimes to the people who, who, could, are, who could best help them. And, and so if you can kind of replace all that with, you know, the whole purpose here is to solve your problem and make you happy with it. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what we're going to do. And we're going we're gonna to lead with the positive emotions rather than, uh, you know, the, the emotion of, well, we, we saved ourselves uh, somebody having to talk to you personally. I, I had a horror story where I was trying to get somebody to leave a package on the porch because it was going to rain. So I called up UPS and basically I was in the situation where I was going to the airport to get on a plane, trying to get them to deliver it, put it in the porch instead of where they were going to leave it outside. And they kept asking me to repeat a you know 12 digit number to the telephone thing. And basically I would do it really slowly. And like I did it seven times. It always said, you know, we cannot understand this number. And I never talked to a human and I had to call up my neighbor and ask them to Move, move it to the porch when, when it was delivered. So it, it just did a fantastic job for them of keeping me from talking to a human to solve my problem. But it really made me think, wow, I, I hope that a lot of other people are not having this problem because they're going to lose customers uh, if they keep doing this to people. That's such a good example of, I think, generative AI gone wrong. I think it's the retail experience that an awful lot of people, which I think is frustrating customers right now. That's why I think a lot of customers are, are dead against it or they feel that the people have been removed from customer service because that's their experience. So we're definitely not there yet. But I think I have a lot of hope from this conversation that we're on the journey. We're definitely on the right path. And I'm loving this idea of your value pyramid that we just start building on it now and we bring everyone into that conversation. But look, final question for you, Peter. And again, with everything that you do from being an investor and an author and associate professor, what's coming up for you over the next few months? Well, I am doing a lot of talks about this to different companies. I'm doing podcasts. I'm talking to boards of directors about this. I, I'm finding it very exciting. And I'm also very uh, pleased that Babson has allowed me to teach a course, which will be starting in the spring, on Brain Rush. So I'm hoping that a lot of students will sign up and the course will remain relevant as all this technology changes over time. Because to me, that's one of the, the beauties of being a professor is engaging me in front of people who are just starting their careers and trying to figure out how to make something that's really relevant and value to, valuable to them. And so, you know, my, my mission is really to AI proof my students and to AI proof people in general, which is a way of saying, make them turn that technology into something that will help their careers rather than hurt their careers and build on their strengths and build on AI strengths and sort of a partnership there. I love that. And that's a great message as we move forward because it's not going anywhere. I think it's now the time to embrace it and embrace it in the right way. But look, if you've enjoyed today's podcast episode, please do like and share it because it's such an important one. Remember, you can listen back to past Retail Tea Break episodes on your favorite podcast platform or, of course, on YouTube. Connect with myself on Peter and LinkedIn. And obviously, I'll pop the details of the new book, Brain Rush, How to Invest and Compete in the Real World of Generative AI. I'll pop all the details in the show notes and, of course, on the social media posts that go out with this episode and remember you can find the show notes and the transcript for today's episode on the retailadvisor.ie peter thank you for an incredible conversation i think this is only the start of retail's journey with uh, generative ai and i have no doubt we'll have you back on soon to talk about it a bit more thanks so much thank you melissa have a great day